Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. And now, the Friday Crime Report. Indianapolis, Indiana, Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. On the afternoon of October 12th, Indianapolis police had asked for the public's help in locating 18-year-old Joseph Thomas. The teenager had last been seen on October 10th, and his family was worried. Around 6 o'clock on October the 12th, the family of another person, Michael James, were becoming worried as well. James was the father of two young children. They had been trying to reach him for over a day, but hadn't been able to make contact. They had no way of knowing they would soon find out where he was, tragically. At a little before 8 o'clock p.m. that night, an off-duty officer who was working security at a rural business next to I-465 was making his rounds on the property. He came across two dead bodies in a wooded area near the site, and then a third body in the area nearby. According to a police affidavit, more than 59mm cartridge casings had been found near one of the victim's bodies. Police had been called and identified the three victims as Michael James, age 22, Abdullah Mubarak, age 17, and the third victim was Joseph Thomas. All three of the victims had died from gunshot wounds. Police located the mobile devices belonging to the victims. James had an iPad, and on it, police found that he had been having a conversation with a then-unknown profile. This unknown user had been asking James to meet them and said that they should take a path to the field because a highway blocks the shots. Police eventually determined that this person was a 16-year-old who had been making contact with all three of the victims prior to the murders. His name is Caden Smith. Police obtained a search warrant and surveilled a relative's home that Smith was staying at. The home was right across the interstate from the murder scene. Police positioned themselves outside the home, and they made announcements for 10 minutes for Caden Smith to come out, but they got no reply. A standoff ensued. SWAT was called in. They used flashbang devices and shot out the bedroom window with a non-lethal device. They then sent a UAV into the home. The UAV followed Caden Smith through the residence with the police trying to get the killer to surrender peacefully. Caden Smith exited the house briefly and police instructed him to walk towards them, but Smith refused to comply with the officer's commands, and he even tried to go back into the house. Police used a super sock round on him. They tried to tase him, but that had no effect. Nonetheless, he was still arrested. During the search of the house, police found two guns on Smith's bed. Forensics would establish that one of the firearms was the weapon used in the triple murders. In addition to that, they found an assault rifle modifier, a plastic bag with unfired bullets, a bulletproof vest, more than 103 grams of methamphetamine, nearly 74 grams of marijuana, and several pills. In addition to that, police also found several cell phones with internet searches such as, does freezing a gun remove DNA? Homicide lawyer costs. How long does it take police to get phone logs? And how many deaths is considered a mass murder? One of the phones the police found in Smith's bedroom showed more than 10 calls between himself and Joseph Thomas's phone just days before the murder. In another cell phone, police forensic analysts found online searches inquiring about Joseph Thomas's missing status. Smith would be arrested on a slew of charges, including three counts of felony murder, three counts of felony robbery, felony possession of methamphetamine, resisting law enforcement, and possession of marijuana. Police announced that he would be tried as an adult. And I'm sure that you noticed in his mugshot that Caden Smith's trying to put on his best look at me, I'm an innocent little scooter from the suburbs look. This is what people like him picked up from the Karens and the Beckys whenever they get their butts in a crack. Try to put on your best look at me, I'm an innocent member of the dominant society face. On a side note, you'll notice the lengths that the police went to to avoid harming a triple murder suspect. Interesting how their training consistently makes it where they can arrest armed white suspects while consistently killing black unarmed citizens. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Anyway, the cops had all the goods on this guy. This was as good a slam dunk open and shut case as you could ask for. Three murders, the killer caught, police find the murder weapon, and tons of messages directly linking him to all the victims. But of course, the killer has genetic immunity from law. Last month, Caden Smith's trial was supposed to begin, but the judge, Jennifer P. Harrison, suddenly decided to throw out the search warrant. She claimed that the search warrant was improper, even though another judge had signed off on it. 
The excuse she was using was that Smith's lawyer claimed the police couldn't have known that the murder weapon was in Smith's bedroom. I guess for Judge Harrison, it doesn't make sense that if someone is staying at another person's home, that they might keep their belongings in the room that they sleep in. The judge also announced that she was going to suppress the murder weapon, which is the key evidence linking Caden Smith to the murders. The Marion County DA's office has filed an appeal, and they've obtained a stay on the case until the appeal is heard. In the meanwhile, Judge Harrison ordered that the killer be released from custody, and that all he has to do is wear an ankle monitor pending trial, and he has no restrictions other than he can't leave the state. Now, this judge clearly didn't make this decision based on the law, or how clearly dangerous this animal is, or the facts of the case. She made her decision based on something else. Her own personal prejudices and biases. She did everything she could to throw out the entire case because she personally did not want a prosecution to go forward. Part of Caden Smith's conditions of release, other than being the right complexion, was that he could have no contact with firearms, nor can there be firearms in the residence where he's staying. Well, that was last month, and just to show how stupid this judge was, just last week, the day before Thanksgiving no less, Caden Smith was arrested. Again. Caden Smith was celebrating his 18th birthday at a friend's house. The reason for this second arrest is that investigators had found Smith's Snapchat account. Tonight we're getting our first look at the Snapchat post that landed a murder suspect back in jail. On the day Caden Smith turned 18, police obtained a search warrant for a house he was hanging out at. According to new court documents, police found guns, drugs, and ammunition. In the arresting documents, a detective wrote that Smith was ordered to, quote, have no firearms, deadly weapons, or ammunition in his possession. But during a search warrant last week, police claim they found multiple guns, one which was reported stolen. Detectives also claim they found Smith's Snapchat account. After obtaining a search warrant, detectives say they found several photos and messages involving guns and drugs, including these photos from a Snapchat video police say was taken just a day after Smith was released. Detectives also obtained this photo from early November of what police say appears to be Smith holding a handgun and a GPS monitor around his ankle. Did you get all that? This guy resumed breaking the law the moment he got home from court. He didn't even wait a full day before he went right back to committing crimes. Police found this guy still got guns around him, one of them stolen. He's found with a ton of contraband. And he's taken video and photos of himself smoking weed, holding guns, and posting this on the internet as he prepares to return to his life of selling drugs. This is who the corrupt judge Jennifer Harrison saw fit to put back out on the streets. This is the person who she claims rights were violated. His rights were violated. Yeah, because certainly this guy's not a criminal. Smith's now been charged with dealing marijuana, visiting a common nuisance, invasion of privacy, and violating his pretrial release conditions. We got a regular white boy Rick here. And why not? He sees that there's a corrupt judge who was willing to totally ignore the law so she could engineer an excuse to release him. He knows that racial privilege is in full effect in Jennifer Harrison's kangaroo court, so why not take advantage? A judge has ruled that this accused killer be held without bond for now. But this only applies to his violating his release conditions, because he's scheduled to be released again on December 9th, unless prosecutors can convince the judge that he'll break the terms of his release a second time. That's right. This accused triple killer is going to be released again next week. When you got genetic immunity from law, you get unlimited chances to commit crimes. So you see, it's not just Kyle Rittenhouse who the courts will ignore the law to protect from punishment. Here you have yet another teenager who shoots three people. But the difference here is that this creep killed all three of his victims. Judges like Jennifer Harrison are on code when it comes to racial immunity from law. She understands her purpose in the courtroom is not to interpret the law, but to maintain a racial double standard. She's not there to protect constitutional rights. She's there to protect genetic immunity from law. Certain offenders must be allowed bail no matter their crimes. Certain offenders can't be hit with heavy charges. She can't allow that. Well, unless they harm someone from the dominant society, and even then there's no guarantee. So when Judge Harrison saw this killer in her court being charged with triple murder, the only thing she saw was someone with the right skin color being accused of killing three black people, and she decided right then and there she wouldn't allow it. Laws be damned. 
There's a two-tier judicial system in America, and people like Jennifer Harrison are upholding that racial double standard. It's not being done by accident. It's being done deliberately. Had Caden Smith been black and his victims white, does anyone seriously believe that this judge or any judge would have released him under any circumstances? Does anyone seriously believe that if Smith had been black, all he would have had to do is claim that the police couldn't have known that the gun was in his bedroom and the judge would say, all right, I'm suppressing the gun, I'm suppressing everything. And this judge's flagrant corruption is only part of what this case teaches us because this crime also demonstrates something else. We have a lot of mysterious killings of black people in America that go completely unsolved. You hear about them almost on a daily basis. The police and the white media push the phony narrative that these are all black-on-black -black crimes. Even though they don't have a suspect, they don't know who's committing them, but they claim, well, that's who's doing it. They never racially pathologize other groups. John Benet Ramsey was certainly murdered by another white person, as was Natalie Holloway. But no one in the white media has ever called that white-on-white -white crime. This anti-black racial narrative is meant to give cover to the real killers. Back in June, I told you about another triple murder. This one took place in the Detroit area. One of the victims was a six-year-old named Tyrese Moore. The white media fanned the flames of black-on-black -black crime. And, in the absence of any other evidence or information, the black community in that area blamed themselves. And they said the white media is right. Black people are just slaughtering each other for no reason, etc., etc. And then the real murderer was arrested and charged. He wasn't black, but the white media was completely and thoroughly unconcerned with that. See, there's all these unsolved murders of black people that happen in places like Chicago, Detroit, Indianapolis. These Midwestern states are places where we see a high number of these mysterious killings where the police claim they never could find a suspect. But the white media pushes the insinuation that, well, whomever did it must have been black because, well, reasons. And we in the black media have told you that you better start pushing back against that narrative because in the cases where we do find out who's committing these mysterious shootings, we're seeing that the perpetrators aren't black at all. Obviously, we're going to be keeping tabs on this case to see how things shake out. But this particular crime is instructive on a variety of levels. The main lesson to be taken away from this crime is that letting the white media focus you on the wrong killers allows the right killers to walk scot-free. Well, that and corrupt judges who ignore the law. And that's this week's Friday Crime Report. Keep your eyes open and stay on alert, because there's a lot worse criminals out there than the ones the white corporate media chooses to show you. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Amir Miller, David Green, Low Have Mercy, Marvin Woods, and Wesley Monroe. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.